produce a product, an end product, that you all know and are so familiar with and sometimes doesn't talk to you, but I want it to talk to you. So let's start by looking at, at some of these processes now that we have. <coughs> and then the next slide we see that we're going to start off a hot working uh, process by taking the molten metal that was in the teeming ladle and putting it in an ingot. Actually, there are a number of different ingot designs. Uh, we find that we have big end up ingots and big end down ingots. So if we're not using continuous casting, the technique is to pour the material in a mold that looks like this. Since the outside lines here are parallel and the inside lines you see are not parallel to the outside lines, it tells you that the ingot, which is cast into this cavity, is going to be bigger at the bottom than it is at the top. So it's a big end down ingot mold. After the ingot solidifies, and when it does that, it'll have a big pipe that comes down like this. But after it solidifies, we can take a crane, grab this ingot mold, and pick it up off of the stool, this being the stool now that we've cast into. People frequently are interested in, you know, what do you where are you going to make this stuff out of, you know, that you're going to cast a, an ingot that's going to be 40 by 40 by 40 inches by 40 inches by maybe 8 feet tall or 6 feet tall. What's this going to be made out of? Well, it's going to be made out of steel, uh, and generally a cast steel. But it's going to be cold relative to the steel. And when we pour the molten metal in it, it hits this cold mold wall, solidifies just as it did in continuous casting, and make, very quickly makes a rim or skin around the outside. And these chill crystals then prevent the molten metal from seeing that steel mold. And they shrink away from the wall because the whole thing is shrinking. It's like a solid bag on the outside with molten material on the inside. <coughs> and so we have this separable mold and stool. And so we pick the ingot mold off and it leaves the ingot sitting on the stool and we could cool it there. Homogenize it is what we really have to do. We have to put it in a soaking pit to make sure that we do away with dendritic segregation and make the carbon content homogeneous throughout the ingot and things like that. May leave it in a soaking pit as much as 24 hours to homogenize it. There's another type of an ingot mold <coughs> which has a big end up. And you can see that from this particular design that the big end is going to be up. Now we have a problem because we can't pick the ingot mold off of this we'd have to turn it upside down and somehow uh, to get the uh, ingot out of, out of the mold itself. So how in the world are we going to do this? See, there's no top to grab it with, right? We can't just grab the top of the ingot. <coughs> and so how are we going to get it out of this thing? Well, what we do is uh, put a hot top on it. It serves two purposes, actually. The hot top, which is now a refractory material, a brick, uh, a terracotta-like material. Uh, just a, a high temperature refractory and it nests in the top of this mold, ingot mold it has a shape as indicated here we pour the molten metal in we fill it all the way to the top and when we get it filled to the top to the very top now the, most of the solidification shrinkage will be in that hot top but when we get ready to take the ingot out of the mold we just come along with a great big pincher type crane and we grab the refractory and crush right through the side of the refractory grab the steel and pick the ingot up out of the ingot mold, put it in a soaking pit and proceed from there. Hot working, cold working, and machining are all methods that make metals usable. Most solid metals are crystalline, but amorphous, non-crystalline solid metals, also known as metallic glasses, can be produced by casting molten metal onto a rotating surface. Because amorphous metals have no grain boundaries, they exhibit high corrosion resistance. Methods of hot working include continuous casting and casting into ingot molds. We do other kinds of casting. Now, I'm coming back to that ingot later on in the recitation of, of a product in the steel mill to show you what goes on. But there are all sorts of other kinds of casting that we can do. We can cast the steel directly, or cast the metal, the non ferrous metal, the steel, whatever we have, into molds that are made, say, from sand. This, this is uh, typical of a sand mold setup to, ca to make a casting, <coughs> and I think that we put about all the things in this that you need to know about. In this particular case, we have two parts of a container. <coughs> There's a top, 
and a bottom uh, or a cope and a drag for the mold. So this flask, and we call this other thing a flask, that we can exactly match by the pins on the end so we can ram up in sand the top of the mold and the bottom of the mold and then put them together and we have a match. And we, when we put them together and we have a match, we'll have a cavity that will look like this, except the casting that we want to make here has a hollow in it. We want to have a hole in it. It would be equivalent to want to make a pipe. So as a preliminary measure, what we have done is to make this thing right here, which is called a core. Now that particular core can also be made out of sand. And we generally bond it together with something that will cause the sand to hold together very well. It could be uh, a bonding clay, it could be sodium silicate, it could be uh, a plastic actually, something like a phenolic resin, but uh, it's made and dried separately. Before we ever put this mold together, uh, it is made somewhere else. And then when we put it together, <coughs> we have it going back into the sand. So the sand really grasps this thing and it's held as a cantilever beam out here. Actually, you notice that uh, that's a pretty long section to be hanging onto this one little part. And so we frequently have to put in things that are called chaplets. And a chaplet means it's a tiny little uh, wire or a tiny little piece of metal that helps support the core to keep it in position and we cast the molten metal around it. <coughs> the cavity we're going to cast the molten metal in now is this outside cavity going back in here and coming up like that. <coughs> we're going to pour molten metal into this dried mold or this almost dried mold uh, and we pour it into this basin. It splashes on the bottom. We don't want a high velocity running into this cavity so it, it splashes here and fills up and overflows and comes down and flows into this particular area uh, and fills up what we want as a casting. But we have a problem. If all of this happened and if the metal solidified right there as well, then the molten metal that's left up here can't feed this casting. And so the shrinkage that occurs in the liquid state and in the so solid state would leave porosity in the casting. We don't want porosity in the casting. So we provide with an extra piece of metal that sits up here, and it's called a riser or a feeder. And so we not only manufacture this part, <coughs> this part that we want, but we also manufacture this excess piece. And all it is is a, a residual amount of liquid material to feed the shrinkage cavity. It's generally much, much larger than the feed that we have coming from the, the pouring spout of the sprue. <coughs> well, that's a typical setup for sand casting. Uh, I'd like to describe now a sand casting that's done, a type of casting that might be done, where you get gigantic things produced. And by the way, this casting method will produce gigantic things, turbine casings, big turbine casings. But there's something that's called a Yankee dryer. Does anybody here ever hear of that word, a Yankee dryer? Did you know that in this country we don't make Yankee dryers anymore? They're all made abroad and if we stopped all the traffic and we couldn't get any more product, well, any more Yankee dryers from abroad, the country would probably come to a halt in about uh, three to six weeks. And the reason is because a Yankee dryer is what the pulp and paper industry uses to manufacture creped paper. That means toilet tissue. So this one thing that is necessary to make toilet tissue, which is called a Yankee dryer, we don't make in this country anymore. I think that, is, that ought to almost be grounds for you know, investigation because uh, it leaves us in the middle. Well, let's talk about a Yankee dryer. It's made out of cast iron. They are sometimes as long as 20 feet long. And they are as thick as four to six inches thick. And it has to be made in one casting and it has to be finished. That means it has to be machined perfectly smooth on the outside. And that casting is so big that they cast it in a hole in the ground and they have, they build up the mold walls out of a refractory material and they cast in the top. The cast iron is generally melted in induction type furnaces and they cast something like 90 tons. One of those things, would, one of those castings would weigh 90 tons and they cast it in 90 seconds. So the molten metal is poured into a ring and feeds in the sink 
and then it takes three or four days for it to solidify. And guess what happens when it solidifies? Remember allotropic transformation? The piece of cast iron is going to go through that too. So as it cools, it's going to expand and contract. And people have to go down in the pit and expand or contract turnbuckles to let the mold adjust, otherwise it just crushed the thing. And so, what looks like a pretty simplistic little thing in that sand mold can be a very complicated thing for enormous uh, casting that you want to make, a turbine casing. But we may have many, many cores, many, many parts of it. <clears throat> and sometimes, even in little pieces, we get uh, situations so that we have too many complexities and we can't do it in a sand mold or with that kind of a casting technique and we turn to a very old art which is actually described in uh, Berenguccio's book in 1540 it's called Sir Perdu C-I-R-E-P-E-R-D-U-E -E -E, two words and what that is is the lost wax method of casting and this is an intriguing method uh, to use used to make statuary used to make uh, all sorts of intricate things that you need, like uh, dental bridge work. If you want it to fit your mouth, they take an impression, make rings, jewelry, all sorts of uh, things that you might want to produce, you can produce this way. One of the big things that we depend upon that's made this way today are turbine blades, because turbine blades now are produced with interior sections in them, holes in them for transpiration cooling, for to blow air through to keep the turbine blade cool. And it's a very complex shape to start with. And so these are produced by Sir Perdue method or the lost wax method. So I'd, I'd like to take a look at how this is all done. <coughs> and what you have is uh, something to make you a wax pattern. Now shown here is just a wax pattern. Uh, I, I, I'm going to tell you what the rest of this is going to look like because we're going to follow this wax pattern now in a manufacturing. But all this wax pattern is is a tree or a feeder or a sprue, if you please, that's going to allow us to cast the article that we want to make. So if you're going to do a, a casting, a wax casting, then you, you need such a device. You need to have a wax sprue that you generally attach to the thing that you want to make later on. So all this really says is this is the feeding device, which in the, in the sand casting I showed you is a splash basin, right? And a sprue that fed the cavity, which was going to be our terminal casting. <coughs> well, in the next slide you see that we have to make the wax of the little part we want to make. Now, this is the part we want to make. So we also produce those in wax. And then we attach them to this wax assembly. So in this particular case, the one we're going to follow through, we're going to attach in wax now, just do a little wax welding, a little wax surgery, and you take this thing and you attach it to that uh, feeding mechanism, that feeding piece of wax, uh, and we'll put four of them, one on uh, in each quadrant of this circular section. And then when we put it all together, <coughs> we put it in a flask like this, and we cast on top of it a slurry a mold slurry. This is called an investment and so the whole process is many times referred to as investment casting. And I'll go back in a moment and tell you what those particular materials investments will be made out of. But we're going to cast this slurry which is something like a, a pottery slurry or it's like clay that has too much water in it so to speak. And we pour it around this thing and it fills the cavity completely and solidifies. It sets up like concrete and then we strip it off and you notice now at the bottom of this thing we have the big feeding bell and all of this is wax. Well, in the next slide we see that we have a casting. We have made a casting. But I've left out a step in the slides because if you just cast the molten metal right on top of the wax you'd have a little bit of a problem, particularly if it's high melting material because the wax is going to boil and bubble and try to come out of there and you don't pour molten metal on top of something that's going to boil very easily. <clears throat> so there has to be a step in here before making the casting where we're going to remove the wax. Well, I'm going to describe that again in a moment. But now we've poured the molten metal in the hollow cavity. We've gotten rid of the wax. And every place that we had the wax, we have it filled now with the solid metal. It solidifies in here. We break it all apart. 
and we wind up with a solidified casting that looks like that.